Good uh, morning, everyone, to our panel on the impact of the General Data Protection Regulation on health research practices. Um, we have here uh, an illustrious and cozied up panel and we'll do our best in uh, not to be blinded ourselves with uh, the projector while going through the presentations. Um, my name is Michaela Mayhofer. I represent BBMRI ERIC, that is the research infrastructure for biobanks and biomolecular uh, resources. Um, and uh, we brought this panel here together to really make the case uh, for health research to highlight what are um, the legal basis, what are the issues that we have uh, with the GDPR, what are the challenges, but what are also, so to say, the, the, the good news from a country perspective. And um, the panelists um, will obviously be ready for your questions. And we do our best to keep the speaker time short because the really interesting part, of course, um, always starts with the discussion. And I would like to hand over to my colleague, uh, Isabel. Welcome, my name is Isabel Heus. I'm a professor at the University of Leuven. And um, as all of us here, we are all um, members of the um, common service uh, on LC at the BBMRI. Um, our first speaker is Tom Sadrington from the University of um, uh, Turku, attorney and engineer, also researcher and practical uh, lawyer and member of the Medical Ethics Committee. Tom, please, you give you the word. Thank you, good morning. Um, let me see. There we go. And I'm half blind, so, okay, that's better. So we pretty much prepared three different topics and the first of them is the legal basis for, for, for uh, processing personal data in, in health research and, and we take the country views and, and discuss a little bit what, what our countries are thinking about, about this theme first. Um, so to jump right in here, I'll explain a little bit about the laws and acts that govern health research in Finland. So there are several acts that, that could come into play. We have a new Data Protection Act, which is the, the, the most interesting one in, uh, for the GDPR. Um, and then we have older acts, that some of which are, are being changed, um, um, partially because of GDPR, partially because there are other EU regulations, partially because there are other reasons for, for updating them. Um, there's the Medical Research Act, uh, which concerns mainly interventional research, uh, but also the research ethics committees and things like that. It has some provisions about content, uh, for example. We have the Status and Rights of Patients Act, which um, governs research use of patient data, among other things. There's an Openness of Gov Government Activities Act, which, among other things, tells you how you can obtain um, data from, from public sources to, to your research uh, project, also, also health data. We have a Biobank Act, um, which governs access to tissue and data that's being administered by, by our registered biobanks. Um, it has um, provisions about broad consent, for example, and that's now being um, reviewed and, and redrafted because there are some opinions that the, it's actually too broad, the content is too broad um, to be compliant with the, with the GDPR. Uh, but the opinions vary here as well. There's a sort of a Tissues Act also. Um, then we have pending in Parliament uh, an act on the secondary use of health and social data. Um, the, in the Ministry there's an in drafting a Genome Act um, so you can see there are quite a lot of different things going on uh, in, in the legal side um, and basically all of these could come into play uh, for a single research project if you have, if you're combining, for example, in interventional research and then co collect information from public registries and, and so forth. 
Uh, one of the interesting things I find in this is the choice of law. So, so you might find yourself um, having a data controller in France, for example, and then you would actually um, apply the French uh, Data Protection Act and not the Finnish one, but you would still have to comply with all the Finnish national uh, other acts on, on, on your research project, and that could be uh, become interesting. But more on this uh, legal basis uh, topic now, um, the Data Protection Act came in a little bit late. It's now been in force uh, for four weeks or, or so. Um, and it provides that when data processing is necessary for scientific research, um, then you can invoke the Article 6 one uh, e the public interest basis for your for your research. And uh, the, the further requirement is that uh, that the processing is in proportion to the in public interest that you're you're pursuing. However, then you're going to weigh that. Uh, for health research, um, there's another uh, other paragraph that's that's of of importance, and that's um, paragraph six, which is saying that. Article 9.1, which is uh, preventing the use of, of a special category data, is not applied to processing for scientific research, provided that suitable and specific safeguards are in place. And there's a long list of, of possible technical, procedural, and organizational safeguards that you could take. Uh, there's also um, um, a paragraph on the derogations from rights for, for scientific research purposes based on uh, the GDPR Article 89, and there are specific safeguards then that you need to take there. Um, especially interesting, again, for, for health research, where you typically um, use sensitive special category data, is, is that if, if you want to be exempted from, from Articles 15, 16, 18, and or 21, then, then you need to perform a um, an impact analysis and provide that the results to our national supervisory authority, the data protection ombudsman. So there, so I would uh, foresee that health research will become more and more reliant on, on public interest as, as, as the legal basis for data processing, not consent, which is, uh, might be difficult to get a valid one, uh, for example, in a patient-doctor uh, relationship. And I think uh, the, the public interest will be substituting consent even in, in, in cases where you need a consent for other purposes, like, like, like performing interventions on the, on, on the subjects. So then you have a consent form, you have information leaflets, and there you give information about data processing. And, but then, then, then the, the, you basically state that the legal basis is then something else than the consent. It's the, um, National Data Protection Act and then, then the GDPR articles. Um, we have traditionally done a lot of research in, in Finland uh, based on um, legal grounds, not, not content, but I think this is now going to be wider and wider. Um, and I'm, okay. Uh, two more topics to go through. Um, so that was the legal basis topic. Now we are um, going into the definition of personal data. This is something that I've never really gotten over. I always stuck, get stuck in this one. Um, so you know this one. Of course, personal data means any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. Um, I have a quote here from Ludwig Wittgenstein. I think he was an Austrian originally, right? Uh, what should we gain by definition as it can only lead us to other undefined terms? And I think the personal data definition is, is a mother of all, all undefined definitions because you have to explain all the components you have there and you can use several pages doing so. So first of all, it says that data is information, which I find confusing. What is information? Um, then typically data is not information, information is not knowledge, or, or, and, and so forth. Uh, then you have to explain relating to, you have to explain identified or identifiable, and you can have many kinds of opinions where the natural personhood starts and where it ends. 
Um, of course, the GDPR has some 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 basis here um, for for further interpretation. Some of them more helpful than the others. It says, for example, that an identifiable natural person is one who can be identified. Not very helpful, but then it has some some examples of how you could do that, for example, by a name. And then we have, of course, the recital 26 on on this topic, which is more or less the same as, as in the directive times. Um, so some of the national views on, on, on the definition here, um, as I have understood them from discussions from the people from the Data Protection Ombudsman's office and, and from some of their decisions, they seem to be saying that if there is data that somebody somewhere could identify, then that is personal data. They don't think that the Breyer case has any effect on this. They don't think that the uh, Working Party 29 Opinion 4 is any more relevant. They, they do refer to the uh, Opinion 5 uh, from 2014 on, on anonymization techniques and so on. Um, they are also saying that pseudonymized data is always personal data, always. Um, I find this too categorical and, and sort of too broad a generalization, but the, this is what the line they are they are taking, and that might makes life sometimes difficult. It of course also maximizes their their jurisprudence, so to say. They can decide over quite a few things. Um, okay, some examples of what might be personal information, what what might not be. Um, but I can't go into that now because I see so a two-minute sign, so I will very briefly touch on the third topic, which is the research ethics committees and the GDPR and data protection in general. Uh, we have um, two types of ethics committees, statutory and the non-statutory, and both will uh, go into data protection issues, they will give opinions, they will sometimes demand changes and so forth. Typically they are not well equipped to do so, uh, even less so now with the, uh, with the GDPR in place. And, and this has some, some problems, for example, that you cannot appeal a REC opinion, even if it's based on, on legal analysis, if you, if, even if you think that it's plainly wrong, uh, you cannot appeal. You can file again and try to get another opinion, but there's no appeal process, which is problematic, I think, as a lawyer. Um, liabilities are, are a bit tricky issue, so what if the rec requires you to do some changes as a controller, and then it turns out that, that they were actually wrong about their, their advice, uh, so it's liable. Well, you are as a controller. Um, and we've already seen that there, there is national fragmentation from, from uh, committee to committee. Uh, there's certainly European fragmentation and there's certainly uh, international fragmentation. So my personal opinion is that ethics committees should concentrate on the ethics and not do um, far-going legal analysis on, on, on these things. Um, this running through all the three topics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom, for this very, uh, very nice and in-depth insights. Uh, we are now going over to our second speaker who will uh, give and shed the light on the perspectives of the, of the UK. Victoria Chico uh, is an academic lawyer at the University of Sheffield. She has published very widely on data protection and on sharing of genetic information in the familial context. And she's also data policy advisor to the Health Research Authority in the UK, where she is instrumental in developing policy concerning the implementation of the GDPR and the harmonization with national law and also with guidance. So thank you very much, Victoria, for sharing us. Um, so I've come here today in my policy role as a, um, the data protection uh, policy advisor for the Health Research Authority, which is the body which governs health research in the UK and advises the Department of Health. Um, sorry. So we, um, just wait for my slides.
So I'll start. So um, what we wanted to talk about today was three particular themes that we thought were problematic for the cross-border harmonization on um, flows of data and areas that we thought were creating significant fragmentation at a national level. So we identified these three issues under the GDPR to be the, the three issues that Tom's gone through. So the legal basis for processing personal data, the definition of personal data, and the role of ethics committees in considering data protection. So um, the first of those, so thinking about um, this idea of, of fragmentation, the purpose of the GDPR was to harmonise the processing of personal data across Europe. But the GDPR gives significant room for differences at a national level. And my day-to-day -day role at the moment is very much based around planning for a no-deal Brexit, and I'm thinking very much about adequacy and adequacy decisions. And one of the things that um, has been increasingly apparent to me is that the level of fragmentation does interfere with this idea that, we're, that other countries are adequate, because we've all got so, many, so much wiggle room there, so much uh, discretion, that if we're looking at, if we, if we take different um, approaches to what is personal data, then at a very basic level, we have, we have very different rules. And even within the GDPR area, um, suggesting that other countries are adequate might become problematic. So thinking firstly about the legal basis, I think historically this has been one of the, um, the biggest issues for uh, fragmentation across Europe. And in the UK, we've taken a very clear position on this, and it's very um, uh, visible on the Health Research Authority website that we are directing our researchers, our NHS trusts, um, to that consent is not the lawful basis for pr uh, processing data for health research. And we're very clear about that. You should not be relying on consent. Um, we advise that if you're a public body, you rely on same as in Finland, you rely on uh, the fact that what you're doing is a task in the public interest. Um, and particularly when you're a public body, the GDPR suggests that the imbalance of power there means that you shouldn't be relying on consent. Consent is perhaps not in theory the best way of protecting individuals in those um, imbalanced relationships. This doesn't apply if you're a pharmaceutical company or if you are somehow other not deemed to be a public authority. And even the definition of public authority across Europe is not consistent. Um, we do consider our research councils and uh, hospital trusts to be p public authorities. If you're, a research, uh, if you're a pharmaceutical company, you can't rely on the fact that your task is in the public interest. So uh, we, what we advise our pharmaceutical companies to do, rather than relying on consent, is to rely on the fact that they are processing data for their legitimate interests. Now, you will need to do a lot more to justify that than the public authorities need to do to justify um, a task in the public interest. And then both of them would rely on the condition for setting aside the prohibition under Article 9 that what they're doing is processing data necessary for scientific research. Um, this might be a problem, particularly we have found at the Health Research Authority that it's a problem when advising pharmaceutical companies on cross-border trials because other countries want to rely on consent for the data processing element of the, um, the research project. And in clinical trials, historically, consent has been such an important principle that it's difficult to move away from that. But that is consent to the risks of the clinical trial. And we found this to be quite problematic because some pharmaceutical companies are saying, well, actually, we want to rely, rely on consent. And that obviously entails a, a um, right to withdraw that consent. So we've kind of got round this in the advice that we're giving to our pharmaceutical companies in quite an odd way, because under the clinical trials regulation, you have to retain data for ph pharmacovigilance reasons, and um, the clinical trials regulation does require retention of that data. So what we're saying now is, well, okay, you can rely on consent for the collection of the data, but then you rely on legitimate interest for the subsequent processing and the storage. So that's Make of that what you will. I'm not sure that's a good idea, but that's what um, is being recommended. So that's one area where I think there may be significant fragmentation. And the rights of um, European citizens are different. 
you know, maybe in where consent is the basis, people are allowed that right to withdraw and they're given that opportunity to consent. And if in other member states there isn't that right to withdraw, questions will be raised about whether other countries are adequate. Um, so coming on to the second theme that we think is problematic for fragmentation, and that's the role of ethics committees. Ethics committees um, are there to consider the ethics of, a, a, a tr of um, research, and this includes research involving the processing of personal data. Historically, particularly in the UK, again, they were set up very much to consider clinical trials and the safety of participants in clinical trials. So again, we find that consent is perhaps being overemphasized. Um, and uh, our ethics committees in the UK do consider data protection issues, but we find very much that even though as a policy matter we're saying, no, you do not rely on consent, at the level of ethics committee approval, there's this re-emphasis back on consent. Well, where's the consent to data processing? Um, and I came to a meeting at the European Commission on this in October last year, and again, I think we're seeing this fragmentation at ethics committee level that Ethics committees are taking very different approaches to the ethics of data processing. Um, and some of them are taking a more um, sort of approach that's moving away from clinical trials and saying, okay, we might not need consent to the data processing element of clinical trials, even though you might need to consent to the physical risk element. But again, this is, I think, creating significant fragmentation. Moving on to the last of our three uh, themes that we identified as um, creating significant fragmentation across Europe. And this goes to the very essence of the protection of processing of personal data. What is personal data? And we can't even really come to an agreement on this, I don't think, even within, uh, even within the national boundaries. Um, the GDPR applies to personal data, and this means any data relating to an identified or identifiable uh, natural person. You don't need to buy, a, a, this means directly or indirectly identifiable. Um, and then it gives a definition of pseudonymized data. Uh, and this is where um, you, the individual is not uh, identifiable directly, but may be identified by the um, amalgamation of two sets of data or with a code. Um, and in, in the UK, we've very much taken the approach at a policy level that the definition of pseudonymized data is dynamic. We don't think it's something that kind of um, is necessarily clear and it should be uh, analysed on a case-by-case -case, case basis. We definitely do not take the position that all pseudonymised data is personal data. In fact, we go almost to the other extreme and we define um, pseudonymised data in many circumstances to be non-identifiable data. And I think, again, that puts us in a very different position to some of the member states where actually pseudonymized data is just about being less identifiable. So what some of the member states would deem to be anonymized, I think um, we deem pseudonymized, there's a kind of equivalence, we would say pseudonymized data would equate to anonymization in some other uh, um, states. Um, and again, this lead could lead to significant, uh, um, significant uh, differences across borders and member states because this is the very essence of what the GDPR is seeking to protect and if we can't agree on what personal data is then it will get different protection uh, depending on the national boundaries. So I think national laws, national policies and guidance here are leading to significant fragmentation and these kind of conversations across borders will be very helpful. Thank you very much. Pass on to my next. Panel. Thank you very much for uh, for your views on the uh, the situation and the implementation also in the UK. Um, I am now uh, going over to uh, France, where we have Gauthier Chasson, who is lawyer at the French Institute of Health and Medical Research in Inserm in Toulouse Medical University. He is specialized in bioethics, privacy, and data protection. He is also a very active member in our uh, Common LC Service uh, LC Group and expert at the European Commission on Research and Ethics. Good day. Thank you very Well, thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, so I will go straight for letting the others also um, present after me. So what is the situation in, in France? I would like 
first to provide you a general overview of uh, what happened because France has known an intense regulatory activity uh, in the last years, first regarding the revision of the National Data Protection Act for the creation of a new national health data system. Uh, collecting all the information from um, uh, the health systems and opening it for research uh, uses and our conditions. Regarding also the digitalization of the society and the open data policy and regarding GDPR implementation with a new law in 2018. And also regarding the modification of the French research law, the French biomedical research law, um, and in particular in 2012 with the law that entered into force in 2016, that is redefining the categories of research and uh, is now talking about research involving the human person. It contains specific uh, provisions to adapt the application of the data protection law. Um, and we have also, of course, ongoing debates on the modification of the bioethics law that is concerning also uh, um, interaction with the human body and uh, uh, the use of samples. So both frameworks apply uh, to health research and cross-reference themselves, uh, what gives uh, us a lot of work as lawyers. The National Data Protection Authority is the CNIL, um, and so she had an important uh, effort of communication towards the public and professionals uh, regarding data protection. She ran several public consultations on important themes. And uh, since 2016, she is now very active in the topic of digital ethics, what is broader than simply the legal aspects. And uh, she has also a laboratory for digital innovation that is publishing prospective studies and that is innovating also in the field of data protection uh, by creating tools or guidelines um, um, and some are available in English, so feel free to use. Regarding the notion of personal health data, the French laws, the French Data Protection Act, refers to the GDPR regarding the definitions, so it's a broad definition, including any kind of uh, information that uh, relates to a natural person, uh, whatever the source of it. And according to the CNIL, it has to, um, to be assessed and qualified on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, we have three kinds of personal data. Uh, the CNIL has provided some other information to identify the personal health data. We have health data by nature. Uh, we have health data by analysis or cross-processing that reveal information about the health of the person and by destination, meaning the data becoming health data because they are used into the medical field. As soon as we have personal health data, it has some legal consequences. Data controllers and processors uh, will be in particular subject uh, to the Article 8 of the Data Protection Act, that is fixing the prohibition of personal health data and exceptions, including research. Uh, rules about the medical and professional secrets, rules about the qualifications of professionals in research, uh, rules regarding the hosting of data, regarding the restricted availability of the data, the so prohibition to seed or to commercially exploit the health data, personal data, that's interesting and referentials for security and interoperability of the health data. Regarding anonymization, uh, the CNIL refers, uh, uh, as it has been said also for Finland, to the Article 29 Working Party uh, uh, definition and guidelines. So anonymization is a personal data processing, leading to data rendered anonymous in such a manner that the data subject is not or no longer identifiable. So three criteria are, are used for defining if a data set is uh, anonymous or not. First, uh, individualization must be impossible. It is not possible, it has, to not, it has not to be possible to individualize person within uh, that, the same data set. Correlation is possible, so identifying the person by crossing the information. Inference is impossible. Inference is about a deducing, deducting the identity of a person by using uh, the data you have uh, in your possession. A data set uh, that is not respecting one of these criteria is not anonymous and has to be, uh, um, and, and there is a case by case analysis. No explicit notion of contextual anonymity, as we can see in Germany, for example. Um, so, but 
the LIL includes the fact that for knowing if we are dealing with personal data, we have to take into account all the means reasonably likely to be used. What about the legal basis for the processing of sensitive uh, uh, data in health research? It depends heavily on the qualification of the research and its attached law. So for research involving the human person, such as clinical trials, for example, we will uh, apply the rules of the public health code first and then of the LIL, but public health code is a legal basis. For the other kind of researches, studies and evaluations in the field of health which do not involve the human person, we will apply directly the Data Protection Act, the LIL. And uh, for genetic data processing, whatever the kind of research, we will apply the specific provisions of the civil code and the public health code. So we need, for each kind of research, a case-by-case -case analysis. And in any case, for the specific data protection requirements, we will uh, refer to the CNIL sectorial referentials and the Data Protection Rules, Act Rules. Uh, Indeed, whatever the legal basis, uh, data controllers and processors must respect the general principles of personal data processing, lawfulness, fairness, transparency, etc., accountability. So we have same rules than in the GDPR, so personal health, genetic, biometric uh, data are sensitive data whose processing is exceptionally allowed uh, for research when the person has given consent or where the scientific research is pursuing a public interest uh, or also where the data are shortly anonymized uh, according to methodologies that will be validated by the Data Protection Authority. Same exemption regarding the long-term storage duration of personal data solely for archiving or scientific research. This is very useful for uh, biobanking. We have a presumption of compatibility for further uses of personal data uh, for scientific researches. And um, consent, as it has been said, is only one of the actionable means for processing uh, in research. It will depend on the category of, uh, of, uh, of the research. Little focus on genetic data. According to the French law, uh, the collection and processing of genetic data is only allowed for medical or, or scientific purposes. Written, express, free, and informed consent uh, from the data subject is required for any first processing of this data, but since 2016, for the reuses of uh, um, biological samples, including so genetic analysis, we can rely on an opt-out consent, so after information, of course, what is much more practical than previously. Interesting point, uh, the public interest purpose of the activity became really central to the uh, Data Protection Act in France. Um, we have an article saying that processing ruled by the chapter on research can only be implemented in consideration of their public interest purposes. So what is the definition of public interest? This is very complicated. There is no exhaustive definition, but we have sever several provisions allowing interpretation and content representation. And it's, if you are not running a research in uh, pursuing a public interest, it will have some legal consequences for you in terms of procedures and rules to apply. So as I said, the legal regime for data protection depends on the qualification of uh, the research at stake. So according to the public health code, we have three kinds of researches involving the human person. The first one that is interventional research with risk and constraints for the participants. The second one is research is involving minimal risk and constraints, and the third one is non-interventional research. A fourth type exists, that is health research is um, uh, only based on retrospective analysis of already collected data or samples. And for them, there is only the LIL that is applying and not the public health code. We have simplified procedures according to reference methodologies uh, and the distribution is based on the fact that people have to consent to the research. So uh, the first one will apply to the, to the, to the interventional research, the other to the non-interventional research and the last one to uh, non-research involving human person. In terms of operational content, very quickly, of the methodology of reference, you have kind of data, data storage duration, and all the, the things you need to know for running your research. 
And I will just provide you with an overview of the data subject's rights to be protected in one picture. So as you can see here, you have uh, in the column, you have the methodologies of reference and, um, and the research that are concerned by these methodologies. And you have all the rights uh, here that are dis displayed. Just note that there are uncertainties regarding the right to data portability, because in certain way it could apply in certain uh, uh, contexts, no. We thought that the situation were fixed, but in December 2018, a new act uh, provided that a decree would be uh, adopted for um, deciding about the derogation uh, to data subjects' rights in the context of scientific or historic research or for statistical purposes. So we have to wait to see how much uh, the legislator will go into the derogation to data subjects' rights, but situation could change. Finally, uh, last point, regarding the new role of French research ethics committees that are the Comité de Protection des Personnes, since 2016, they have the mission to assess the research methodology with regard to the provision of the Data Protection Act. Um, uh, but the problem is that the CPPs are not very well equipped, actually, in terms of competencies for dealing uh, with data protection, and they need for training. This is, this is very important. In most of the cases, uh, CPPs check the procedures that are accomplished uh, with the CNIL and their adequacy, but there is no scrutiny of all the details in terms of data protection law. They are assessing the ethics, not the law. And there is no follow-up of the project's uh, practices uh, regarding the implementation of DQL elements. Very briefly, concluding remarks, it's officially uh, ended, so the transposition is officially ended. Uncertainties remain on uh, data subject rights exemptions, important notions such as pseudo or anonymization, scalability, because it's very hard to know uh, when we are in pseudonymization or in uh, anonymous data. Public interest proposals also need some clarification, and um, on the practice of broadened consent, also we need some legal clarification for ensuring legal security on incidental findings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera and the ongoing debates will be very useful for us. Thank you very much, I will stop there. Thank you very much, Cotier. Um, let's go now over to, to Greece, where we have here Olga um, Georgiatou, who is a lawyer and who is also from at the University of Athens, a legal consent, a consultant at the Biomedical Research mm -hmm. Foundation at the Academy of Athens. But also a very active uh, member in our LCBBMRI um, ERIC team, external ethics ex expert at the European Commission on Research and Innovation, and lecturer and masters at the University of Athens. Please, Olga. So good morning. Uh, before I begin my presentation for Greece, I would just like to underline that my presentation today is based on the draft of the Act. Uh, we have not actually implemented GDPR yet. Uh, so the committee has changed and there is information that probably also the draft will change dramatically. So uh, this is today uh, what we know so far. So, um, to begin with, uh, generally speaking, the balance between the interests of the, and the protection of the research uh, subjects and the interests of the society and science, uh, these are not only addressed by the data acts. There are also uh, constitutional provisions that come ages ago, for example, the Human Dignity Article 2 and the Research Article 16, and it was only after the revision of the Constitution and the Directive 9546 in 2001 that we have a constitutional provision on the
the informational self-determination as well. So prior to GDPR and apart from the constitutional provisions, there was also the Act 2472 that implemented the directive. And it was by the heading of the, of the, of the law that we can see that the Greek legislator was drawing the attention to the rights of the individual and no reference to the free data movement as opposed to the directive was mentioned anywhere. So initially it was prohibited to process any sensitive data. Uh, then that could be done in the legal basis of a consent or on anonymization. So the one thing that has changed right now is that this can be done also with pseudonymization, not just anonymization. And it's up to the controller to decide and choose what safeguards best the interests of the subject. Also, the DBIA authorization is now abrogated before it was um, a requirement in all cases, as you can see here. So um, the confidentiality safeguards is also another very important issue that we can see that's addressed by other uh, legal pieces as the medical code of deontology. So when personal information pertaining to health is collected in, within the practice of medical care, this is subject to medical confidentiality. But what happens in the case is that the researcher does not wear the hat only of a medical pr practitioner, he's not a doctor in practice. Uh, there was nothing so far, uh, but the Data Act draft has a really uh, important provision in Article 19, Paragraph 9, saying that researchers, in the absence of such a binding code as the Medical Code of Deontology, are legally bounded by bilateral agreements, such as uh, CDAs or NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, for example, that they have to sign with the controller. So this is a very important uh, provision that we have in the draft, and hopefully this will remain also after uh, with, uh, with the Data Act. Um, we can also find other uh, provision in requirement to the RECs and uh, the uh, role of the RECs as safeguarding the individual rights, once again in the Code of Medical Deontology, where it states clearly that it is required that the research project is approved by the competent uh, authorities. So now we have in, in Greece a system that these uh, can be done either by the Scientific Advisory Board, which is uh, in, in the hospital, or the Ethics Committees, whatever, whatever is the case, whatever actually exists. Um, there is also complementary uh, pieces of legislation on the deontology of research committees, uh, which is, as stated also in the case of other countries, we have a very long tradition in the field of clinical trials. Uh, so the final approval in case of clinical trials is also uh, always given by a national committee of deontology. And as I stated before, in the cases that uh, SAB uh, are in place, they substitute the deontology committees. So what is very, very important is that almost two months before the GDPR came into force, uh, the um, Greek legislator provided for the first time a law regulating the deontology of research committees for all research institutions and universities, which is very, very important. And uh, as you understand, for, for researchers in general, but also for the safeguarding of the privacy of the subjects. And specifically, this provision, Article 21, where it's stated that safeguarding uh, the data protection is one of the most important things that a deontology committee has to make sure. And uh, it, just a very recent new, uh, news, just uh, four days ago, now I say three, but today it's four days ago, uh, a recommendation issued by the National Ethics Committee trials to handle all these overlaps between uh, the uh, RECs that already exist, those from the clinical committees, the administration forms for the reproductive assistance or the research of animals, and tries to, to promote uh, their very smooth cooperation with the Committee of Deontology when it comes to research, because this is also a very important issue. How to do all these recs cooperate when uh, they have to issue a decision? Uh, so the legal basis in Greece for processing health data um, uh, is uh, 
well, these four cases. One of them, of course, is the consent. When the consent is given for health uh, research proposals, it has to be written, always written, specific. And um, when the data controller pr processes uh, data that already exist, uh, he must have, have informed the subject uh, for related proposals. So uh, once again, we go back to informed consent. The third uh, legal basis is when personal data are collected from publicly accessible sources. And the final one, when the data controller can prove that processing is necessary for scientific reasons. And this leads us back to Article 89 GDPR and technical measures and safeguards that are in place. Uh, so, um, also, we have um, Article 19 of the Draft Act, which is quite an innovation uh, for the Greek reality, and it's uh, in alliance with uh, GDPR in the broader consent and the recital uh, in the GDPR. So, uh, the data subject's consent can be very a bit wider in the sense that it can cover multiple researchers or fields of scientific research. So this is quite uh, innovative and very good for research as well. So in regards to restrictions now, there are some restrictions and when it comes to genetic data being processed for um, for a genetic predispositions test, this cannot be handled out for insurance, for example, purposes. Uh, um, of course, uh, for the data subjects, family members, which is a very, very uh, big issue. The second thing that I would like to point out that um, this uh, consultation with the DPA in the case of large scale systematic processing is the only case where the DPA needs to be consulted. So this is an exception. The DPA normally does not authorize, has nothing to do. Uh, the controller does not have any obligation whatsoever to, to go and consult the DPA. Uh, for me, personally speaking, from a scientific point of view, I think it's quite problematic um, for several reasons I would not like to analyze right now. But even uh, saying and defining what is a large scale systematic, for example, processing, it is can be proved to be quite problematic. Uh, we will see what the legislator will, legislator will finally uh, decide to keep. And uh, of course, a very nice and um, a really useful provision is Article 19, Paragraph 8, where it states that the DPO can be uh, appointed by the controller when necessary for every research project, which is very, very important for uh, the <coughs> role of the DPO at the REX. So it's a very practical and very tangible provision uh, when REX do their work and when uh, papers come to us and uh, we have to, to see if everything in, is in place. As my colleague said, um, it's very difficult for REX to, to go into privacy issues and I totally agree uh, with that uh, point. So up until now, as a member of a, an ethics committee, we only had the obligation to check the consent form and that goes with the ethics. And as far as the privacy issues were concerned, a DPA authorization saying that uh, the controller has the authorization was, was enough, was something that we could take in our hands and we were covered and the project would run. In absence of this now, we have to find ways to, to, to overcome the lack of authorization. So it's my personal opinion that this, uh, and it's clearly my personal opinion, uh, I stated it twice, and underlining that uh, this can be um, not substitute, but we as members of ethics committees can be be helped uh, in our role by asking, requiring a privacy statement by the DPO, especially since uh, in the case of uh, Greece, this is also regulated by the previous provision. A DPO can be uh, appointed by the controller. We can take advantage of this really good provision and ask for the privacy statements. And last but not least, and the, the role of a REC, even after the GTPR, is still significant. Even though it does not go inside, in depth, the privacy issues itself, it can ensure, however, either when screening or monitoring, that technical means and safeguards uh, are in place by asking, for instance, uh, DPA, DPIA impact assessments or uh, that privacy by design has been well respected. And this is, of course, 
something that I'd like to close my presentation with, a constant procedure. Uh, privacy issue when it comes to research projects, and this is the role of the REC, is an ongoing procedure. It's not just handling uh, the documents, but it's also checking that everything is in place and constantly updated to the technical uh, updates. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for all these insights from these different uh, countries. We only uh, saw here um, four different countries, but as you know, we have much more uh, other situations now in Europe. And um, that's why we will now here have a, a common discussion among, amongst all of us here. Uh, there might be significant impl um, implications of the uh, working out of the GDPR uh, in Europe for researchers, for clinicians, for patients, for donors. And um, that's what we can talk about uh, here now today. Uh, is there already anyone from the audience who is interested to share with us uh, his or her views about whatever aspects uh, with respect to the legal grounds of processing data or the applications of cross-border border, uh, research? Uh, all other aspects like anonymization or uh, the role of the ethics committees? Yes. Good morning. So um, I had a question. Thank you very much for the presentation. It was uh, quite helpful. Um, but we haven't discussed the legal basis in Belgium. So I would like to have perhaps your view uh, on this. We talked about consent for a few countries. A few countries stated that consent shouldn't be used. Uh, we talked also about public interest and um, legitimate interest. So I wanted to have your view uh, with regard to uh, Belgium. So in Belgium, indeed, we have uh, a different. Uh, we have also this uh, uh, impl um, implementation already of the of the legislation, and we have also also our DPO of our university hospitals here, uh, and from the Leuven un uh, University. Uh, so who can also add to me what? Um, or add uh, or answer uh, how we handle this. But actually, indeed, um, at that point needs to be clarified uh, in, in Belgium. And we have different institutions, for instance, universities who adopt their own uh, policies. And um, yes, it goes also into the direction that in, if research, for instance, if you talk about the legal basis of performing research, that uh, we also look into the direction that um, the uh, public interest uh, formula uh, is the way that uh, um, yeah that that the researchers are, are going into and uh, that policies are written out now. Um, but yes, this is not the moment now the situation in Belgium. Yeah, Grit, can you add something about that? So at least for uh, academic trials, we dare to say that you can rely on public interest and it's not wise to uh, use consent for several reasons. Um, I'm not that sure about uh, commercial trials. I have uh, less arguments there to, to be as firm in my position as uh, compared to, to academic research. Um, but our national law implementing uh, GDPR is not clear on that. It doesn't decide uh, what legal growth what legal ground you should use. And yes, and what might also be an issue is that our legal, uh, that especially when we deal with, uh, in Belgium, with uh, human biological materials, then you have also the biobank law in Belgium, which might uh, not always be in line with the implemented, with the Belgian law which implements the GDPR, since uh, the research on biological materials also is connected with personal data. And uh, there we have uh, a different view also in, in terms of when do you need ethics committee approval or not. Mm -hmm. Hello, uh, I have a question. Most of the research now in academia is made in consortium around Europe. And from what we've seen now, it's a lot of fragmentation. So just 
uh, let's say, a case. Like, if I have a research project, I'm from Romania, I have a colleague from Bulgaria, and we also have some colleagues from France. The colleagues from France, what do, should they uh, be by, considering the fact that maybe the data set is with Slovenian citizenship and some UK provi uh, something from UK. So the France people, how, what should they obey to? Well, actu well, well actually, uh, so as you said, we are still in the situation of a very fragmented uh, regulation, actually, because the European Union doesn't have the competency to rules uh, in details, you know, research activities and health matters. So uh, we are still like this. French people, as Romanian people, and uh, taking taking you know um, activities into the research, have to respect their own national laws. So, in such an area with, where it is very fragmented, uh, I think it push it pushes uh, uh, stakeholders, professionals, to innovate also in the way of uh, managing data, managing personal data, even in constituted constituting you know uh, silos for example like uh, uh, you have a database for uh, Romanian people that you can activate their rights uh, you can, you, have, you have something for the French people etc etc it is not practical but as far as uh, there is no more you know standardization or not uh, uh, you know act at the European U Union level we have to find a way to do so but uh, for sure Romanian people you know exercising their rights according to Romanian law, for example, will have to be satisfied by uh, the French data controller if, uh, if, if he's requested to make an access to the data, for example, or to erase it. But the situation still uh, is complicated. Hello, Claire Guerrel from the European Data Protection Supervisor. I just wanted to mention that uh, last week at the last EDPB plenary, an opinion has been adopted concerning uh, some of the issues that were discussed uh, today regarding the legal basis, appropriate legal basis uh, for the conduct of clinical trials. So uh, some clarity is coming. The opinion is not published uh, yet because it's now following some toilettage uh, there before publication, but every opinion of the EDPB uh, are published, so it will be uh, very soon. And, of course, consistent application by DPA is expected following what has been agreed by all data protection authorities as to the approach to consent, public interest, in, in which cases legitimate interest, etc., uh, is the adequate basis. Thank you. Hi, my name is Vasilis Karantunas and I work with CMS in Brussels. I just wanted to say that um, uh, regardless of the opinion of the EDPB, there was already a reference to that matter in the opinion of Working Party 29 back in 2007, I don't remember anymore, on consent, where they were very clear that consent under data protection should not be confused with consent under clinical trial regulations. The problem is that people who get involved in this exercise do not read the law. And first of all, they do not read the definitions. And the definition of consent under clinical trial regulation is consent to participate in a trial, while consent in data protection is consent to the processing of personal data. So this is the first issue. And the other issue is that people do not respect the fact that clinical trial regulation or the IMD or whatever are without prejudice to the GDPR, which means that GDPR is lex specialis. And you have authorities or research committees or anyone who don't have the competence or power to judge on these issues getting involved and creating all this confusion. And the last point is that those non-experts or those non-competent authorities do not respect that the GDPR relies on the self-assessment of the controller. So at the end of the day, the choice of legal basis is the responsibility of the controller and nobody else. And, it is, and this should be only under the scrutiny of the supervisor or the courts. So my question to you, if you want, is um, let's assume that you have uh, a clinical trial where everything is fine, 
uh, people got the informed consent under the clinical trial regulation, uh, all organizational technical measures are in place, and at some point, and the controller has chosen health research as a legal basis, uh, not legal basis, as an exception to the ban of sensitive data under Article 9, and at some point, uh, a crazy guy in a competent authority or non-competent authority thinks that this is wrong. Would you ever expect a fine, a monetary fine, to be imposed on that controller for uh, his wrong, in their opinion, assessment of the legal basis? Would such a decision would ever be upheld uh, at court level? I think no. No, I don't, I don't think the argument is that there's a wrong legal basis here, because there are a number of legal bases. I think the issue is that fragmentation is a hindrance to cross-border research. That's what we're finding. It's not that there's a wrong and a right. It's that if, for example, um, you know, you have a, a consortium uh, performing a clin clinical trial, if you're collecting data on the basis of consent in one member state and the other member state's policy, so in the UK it's a policy direction to the health research community that they shouldn't use consent. So it's not law, like you say, it's not, it is a controller-based decision, but the, the authority p policy position and guidance is that you shouldn't use consent. And I think the issue is how do you, how do you ensure that those differences don't impact on the ability to do pan-European research, I think. At the end of the day, you need to do what the competent authority says, except if you want to take the risk and go to the courts. I mean, uh, we cannot say anything else here, except if somebody has the courage and the money to manipulate the system and bring this kind of dispute or uh, different approach among member states to the EDPB uh, level and uh, try to, to um, uh, uh, mobilize the consistency uh, mechanism in order to have a, a more concrete uh, uh, answer on this. But, I find it really strange that uh, medical research is one among the very, very few uh, business sectors where the self-assessment of the controller is not uh, uh, respected. While in other sectors, I don't see anyone getting involved in, in what kind of legal basis you would, you would, you would choose. Uh, and let's not forget at the end of the day that in Article 5, you don't have a legal basis limitation. As you correctly said, you can rely on multiple legal bases. You have a purpose limitation. So if your purpose is legitimate, and I think that medical research is legitimate, the assessment of the legal basis is not that much important. Yeah, I just want to reply to what you say. I mean, be, before actually going to the legal basis and to have the control of choice and everything, and having the court deciding things, you're going to have more practical aspects that are going to apply. I mean, the first thing is, okay, people are not going to take a risk of, uh, of playing on the legal basis. They want certainty. Because if you don't have certainty about what's right or what's wrong, for example, researcher will not be able to publish the result because it will be not legally sound in relationship to the data protection. Uh, clinical trial might go down the drain, so you have a uh, uh, research company wasting 100 million of, of euro because they can't use the research. So even before going to the, to the court, or even before someone actually make a decision, they're not going to take the risk. Because the thing is, yes, controllers have the right to do pretty much anything he wants and everything, but no one in the right mind is going to take the risk of that because the, the consequence, both for researcher in academic setting or for, uh, or for economic uh, aspect, are just too big. So they want, and I agree that there's fragmentation, there's a limitation and everything, but they do want to have a certain element of certainty to do what they can do and what they can't do. And of course, then the problem is about what is really capable of being doing on a European scale and what can be done on a national scale. On national scale, it's, it's quite easier to do, but on a, a European scale, it's more difficult to uh, harmonize. Yeah, indeed, thank you. Yeah, I wanted to ask another question because I'm not so surprised about it, uh, of the dis discussion on the legal ground, but what surprises me was the discussion on what's personal data. I thought, or at least from what I learned, the definition of pseudonymized versus anonymized data was clarified a lot by, uh, by GDPR, but I see a lot of confusion um, within the panel today. Uh, 
Yeah, so I'm just speaking for, from my experience in France. Eh? But, uh, so, so, so the notion of pseudonymization is quite clear, but what is, what is really hard to figure out is uh, 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 when do we arrive at a certain point that we can consider that the data are anonymized, anonymized enough to be uh, anonymous data, and so to go out from the GDPR and uh, national laws regarding data protections. This is very, this is very difficult, and could even lead, you know, to different solutions. And uh, and and, uh, and what is called actually the relative anonymity deserve more thoughts, I, I think, and more discussions, because in certain closed contexts, like in research, for example, in a research consortium, where you know where the data are, uh, you know, collected, uh, where they will go, uh, how they will be managed. Uh, so you, you, you know that the people are accountable uh, and they engage to, 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 to be accountable regarding the data. They are practicing one or two coding of the data. So are we still, you know, in uh, what is named synonymous data? Uh, can we consider that it is anonymized uh, data in the context of the consortium? This kind of issues remains even if uh, from the CNIL point of view, uh, as soon as you have a link and uh, a key for uh, re re decoding the data and going back to uh, the participants, you are in the presence of uh, pseudonymous data. So you have to apply the Data Protection Act. But it's, you see, the techniques is uh, merging with law and uh, uh, it's complex. It can be complex. Otherwise, uh, the GDPR did a great job in uh, defining the things, this is my opinion, uh, particularly defining health data and, um, well, but issues remain, of course. Um, following up a little bit on uh, anonymization is as well that in our mindsets, anonymization is seen still as a stable concept and it isn't. Um, anonymization can be uphold only in a certain time frame within a certain context and it can then move. So it links back to the appropriate safeguards in place that will really ensure uh, the anonymity of the data. Yeah. And and one thing there is, at least for me, the definition is context sensitive. So what is uh, personal data in one context might not be in another context. Uh, what's personal data for one um, party who is handling it might not be personal data to somebody else. Um, and there's all kinds of practical difficulties here. How do you even know what is personal data if you don't have the identifiers? How do you know that you could get them from somewhere? Um, I don't think it's clear at all. And if in a certain point of time data is considered as anonymous, mm -hmm. so outside GDPR, so not the protection mechanisms for whatever processing, so sharing mm -hmm. is allowed and sharing will be done a lot. And you know by sharing, combining, compiling, the risk, or yeah, the risk, the the the, uh, the chances uh, increase that the uh, re-identification occurs. So this means that actually in that case, anonymized data is less protected, so to say, than than the personalized data in the end, <coughs> but uh, might lead to re-identification. So this is something which also needs to be considered. But also, then, if 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 data becomes personal data, then it starts to be protected. Um, which it, all, it doesn't mean that it's not protected. It means it is protected from that point on. So I think that's also something to yeah. think about. Okay. Yes? Uh, good morning. My name is Ciprian Cornet. I work for Philips Research in the Netherlands. And I have two questions for the panel here. One is related to um, making reuse of data coming from the USA in a research context, health-related data, whether our, where our colleagues in the USA, they um, indicate that they respect the local legislation, they publish sufficiently protected data, um, I don't dare to say anonymized in Europe, but protected according to their standards, and then um, it's available for everyone in the research community to use it. And now we have our European data regulation, protection regulation, mm -hmm. And what is your advice how to proceed there, how to approach that situation? The second question to the panel is related to um, the operational side at the na national level. I agree with the view that there is a fragmentation among the, uh, the member states that is visible. 
but it, I believe it's also a difference, um, or there is a bit of fragmentation also at national level. When um, it depends with who you are speaking, there is a different uh, knowledge view on uh, the GDPR and interpretation of the text of law. And then whether you have some um, advice on how to approach, how to go about this challenge when in the same country there are different views by different partners in the medical world. I mean here hospitals, for instance. Thank you. Yeah, I think indeed that's right. And that's also where now different institutions within one country adopt uh, policies for their own institutions, which additionally layers up to the different laws that already are there. Um, and in some countries, you already saw this here in uh, the overview, that different legislations, but also different policies uh, are there, especially in France. Petit, well, you, you can say something? Well, uh, uh, yes, I, want, uh, I wanted to say two things. Uh, the first one is regarding your collaboration with the United States. Um, so I would advise first to have a contract with them <laughs> and to ensure that uh, they engage, you know, to have collected their, da their data according to their national law because this is very important. Otherwise, you will be in trouble by using this data that have been collected uh, uh, illegally unlawfully. So th this is something. And then uh, when, when the data enters into your legal order, of course, you will respect uh, also your measures, uh, technical and organizational measures uh, to protect the data as if they were, let's say, uh, European data, at least for the security. Uh, the second point is regarding the different interpretations. So this is also something that is hard to deal with regarding research ethics committees. Uh, due to their composition and uh, to the sensitiveness of people, you know, having a seat there. Uh, but it is also the beauty of this, I would say. But for data protection, uh, I think that one of the points of uh, having such a data protection officer is to have, you know, also um, standardization of the understanding of the rules because they have, uh, normally they have uh, direct contact with uh, national data protection authorities. They should be trained, and uh, they, they are a network. So progressively, uh, the understanding of the interpretation of the that GDPR provisions and national data protection law provisions should uh, be consistent, or, or more and more consistent. Uh, so I think that with the tissue of DPOs, you will have, you should have a better access to advices, and you should also have a better access to standardized opinions <laughs> about yeah. the topic. So, mm -hmm. And I think also that, uh, that at some national levels there are already guidelines also about from the, the data protection authority, so that might help also a lot. Uh, sector organizations might give a guidance, but it's better that it comes from the authorities themselves. Yeah, that was the, the point that I was going to, to pick up on because I've come from the Health Research Authority, which is um, part of our Department of Health. So I think in these kind of grey areas where you're dealing with um, an enormous instrument like the General Data Protection Regulation and you're perhaps dealing with a national r regime of law, which in the UK we're dealing with the case law, uh, which, which protects confidentiality. So trying to actually um, consolidate the two of those is very problematic. So that's where your, um, your government and your departments dealing with different areas should be designed mm -hmm. to create harmonization by creating policy and providing guidance. I mean, part of the problem that we find is that we've got, so we've got the Health Research Authority, we've got the Information Commissioner's Office, the Safe Supervisory Authority, and we've got the Medicines and Healthcare Regulatory Authority. So we've got all of these regulators. So one of the biggest things on the agenda for us at the moment is to create regulati regulatory alignment and we're doing that through something called sandboxing, where people apply to come with their particular research projects and their innovations around um, novel products, um, and that's for t particularly for commercial organisations, and they come and they're able to test things out with all of the regulators in a sandbox, and we hope that that will actually um, help us to um, create a moving instrument with our regulation as well, so that it, it, it actually engages with people working at the coalface to work out what the regulation needs to look like. So that 
but you're right, there's a big problem even nationally creating that harmonisation when you've got a controller-led approach. <coughs> so, uh, um, may I add to, to what Gautier and Vicky said that um, it is important to keep in mind that uh, GDPR is a regulation. So um, by European Union law, regulation regulates everything uh, to all member states and it's very significantly different from a directive. Uh, which uh, can be uh, up to the member states to implement it in the way that they feel that it's the best for the, for the country's interests. But uh, GDPR is a sort of a neighbor, let's say, between a regulation and directive in many cases, not just research. So our hope, of course, I think not only in this panel, but all over the lawyers who are uh, uh, occupying themselves with research uh, law would be to have a regulation that goes and regulates everything across member states and in the country, etc. But this is definitely not the case. We therefore have to keep in mind the good things that GDPR GDPR offers to us, and I think that this panel composition that BBMRI Eric made tries to indicate that. We have four countries up from the north to the south, from Finland to Greece, we have the UK and France as representative examples, and we can see the fragmentation. We can see that even in things like uh, our colleague uh, rightfully said, that pseudonymization and anonymization are already out there, the terms, we have them in GDPR, even to, to uh, uh, to these terms that are very well uh, uh, terminologically uh, given to us by GDPR, we have a sort of confusion. But what are the good tools? One of the good tools, and this is my personal point of view, is the DPO, the enhanced role of a DPO. And this can play a significant role in the big consortiums, in the big research projects. So DPOs from the research projects are the people to be addressed they are the people to, to go to and consult of what happens with our privacy. And they can be uh, um, approached by both the researchers and the privacy, the, sorry, the data subject. So these are good tools that can be used in practice and we see them being used in practice. Uh, of course, it's not something new. The DPO was already back in the directive. Okay, we're not reinventing the wheel right now in GDPR. But now the enhanced role that the DPO has in GDPR is something that we can make a good use. And of course, last but not least, we can make use of the impact assessments. And our role of being part of REX is demanding these documents. It's not right to say that we are part of a REC and we do not have anything to do with privacy issues. Yes, REX uh, uh, traditionally never went into privacy issues, but they were asking for the DPIA authorization. What happened now that we have abrogated the DPI authorization? Should we just leave privacy issues? No we should replace the documents, we should ask for the DPO to provide, we should ask for the controller, the impact assessment. So then we safeguard uh, rights and we balance with research. Thank you. Um, we, we, please. <laughs> I would just add that you might this be able to I'm find sorry, some... I'm um, sorry, this is going to be the last question and then we yeah. are wrapping up. No, no, it's not a question. You might be able to find some arguments or uh, some answers in the EU-US privacy civil decision uh, that was taken back in 2016, where the Commission has taken an entirely different approach to pseudonymization from what was written in the GDPR and where they said that key-coded data is anonymous data and thus escapes the implementation of the GDPR just to make your life even more complicated, if you want. Well, despite the complications and uh, despite uh, the technical hiccups, which I see uh, even as a metaphor of uh, all the regulation and implementation of the GDPR going on in the member states, we do have a, per uh, a positive take on it because uh, we can see it uh, as a sort of spring cleaning. A lot has not, so much has not changed uh, from the directive to the regulation for research, but a lot of things have been introduced and require now uh, as a must uh, clarification. Until this really uh, transcends into the practices, this will take some time. The risk here is, of course, that uh, some research um, will be postponed or put to a halt, especially in relation to the US, because here you have also from the US side a lot of confusion what is going on. Nonetheless, uh, also from the US side, um, they're rethinking with uh, the various um, uh, scandals and um, 
uh, activities media reportage on uh, on privacy issues uh, there are laws and there is uh, an initiative uh, in the state of California that is very much uh, similar to what Europe has done um, in as regards to the GDPR um, now uh, what is the way forward? That is definitely to continue the dialogue with uh, all the levels uh, of uh, researchers, policymakers, and citizens at large. Will it be an easy process? Uh, of course not. Um, will it be meaningful? Of course, yes. And is there any other way than uh, to tackle the issue uh, appropriately? No, there isn't. We live in a digital world, and we, all of us, um, from citizens, um, experts, to researchers, have to be uh, become true digital natives. Thank you for um, uh, attending this panel. Uh, a big a round of applause, please, uh, to the presenters.